Good evening, old union. Glad to be with you on the video. Stephen brought the nice equipment up here for me to get situated, so I'm glad that I get to uh, be a part of your summer series in some way, shape, and form. I hope that you guys are staying well. I hope that you guys are having a good uh, week and you guys are able to affect people's lives for the kingdom because really and truly as children of God, this should always be on our minds, the way that we can affect people for his glory and for his honor. Tonight, I want to uh, bring you a lesson and the title of the lesson is Seen Like Jesus. And what a time for this to be talked about in, in the situations that we are dealing with uh, in this time with the pandemic, with racism, with all kinds of struggles that we're having uh, in the world. What a better time than to see just like Jesus. You know, perspective is an amazing thing. You and another person could see exactly the same thing happen, but later find out somehow you saw two, two completely different things. There was a study with a group of people who didn't realize that they were actually a part of this study, but they went out on a boat on Loch Ness in Highland, Scotland, and it was the home, it, well, it was, and I guess it still is today, of the supposed Loch Ness Monster. And the subjects were told that there had been several sightings by the locals, so it was a good chance that they would be able to see something that, that morning. So as a part of the study, there was a diver that was put under the water and went out on the lake and with him was a plain four by four piece of lumber. And just as the, at, at just the right time, at, at, at the right moment on this voyage when these uh, people were on the boat, this diver would slowly raise up this four by four board out of the water and he'd hold it for a few seconds and then he'd take it back down. When the people on the boat saw that board come out of the water, they couldn't believe what it was. They got so excited. And then when they returned to the shore, as a part of this study, they were asked to draw what they had seen. Could you imagine what every single person drew? A long neck with a head on it. What they saw was completely different from reality because they didn't want to see reality. They wanted to see what they imagined, what they hoped was true. Now, this is my daughter, Libby. Let me hold this up for y'all, okay? Now, if you didn't know it, now you know she's actually a doctor right here. And what I didn't realize until she had told me was that uh, only the only time that a doctor can do their job to the best of their ability is when they have, let me get it a little bit closer, glasses on. See that? When they have their glasses on, then it can give uh, the doctor a better perspective to see. Perspective. The definition is, it's a frame of mind. It's a particular attitude or a way of uh, regarding something. A question as we begin. What do we see when we look into the world? Do we have the right perspective? <laughs> do we have the right lenses on to see the right way? In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38... It's an area of scripture which talks about Jesus going about in all the cities, teaching and preaching and healing. And in verse 36, it says, he saw the multitudes following him and he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion because he knew that this multitude was weary and they were scattered like sheep, not having a shepherd. And in verses 37 and 38, he says to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
And he gives them a challenge. He says to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Here's a question as well. Have we forgot about the mission? Have we really forgot what it's about? See, are we excited to be laborers in the harvest? Do we see souls that need Jesus or have we forgotten about that? What about in our family? What about in our friend circle? Are there people that we overlook? Maybe people because they're good and they don't really get into a lot of trouble. We think they don't really need to hear about Jesus. Or do we see some as hopeless or unsearchable or unreachable? Having in our minds the thought that uh, there's no way that this person would ever want to know about Jesus. Could Jesus really even love them? They're just too bad. So how do I know how to see? How can I have the right vision? We look to the example, don't we? You remember the example that we look to, brethren? It's Jesus. And there's an interesting story from Jesus' life that illustrates the way that he sees and the way that we see. And that's what I really want us to look at. The way that we see and the way that Jesus sees. And then I want us to challenge ourselves to say, is there a reason and is there some things that I can do to change the way that I think to the way that Jesus thinks? Now watch this. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Honest question, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Do you notice the difference between Jesus and his disciples here? The disciples began to break this man down, and they were trying to figure out why he has these problems. What, what was happening? Was it his fault or was it his parents' fault? He had had to have done something to receive this blindness. And really, if it wasn't him, then it had to be his parents that had done something. They looked right over the opportunity for something to happen to this man. And here is a strong thought. They forgot who they were walking with. But Jesus saw a chance to glorify God. He saw with clear eyes what was really going on in this man's life. You know what he saw? You want to know what Jesus saw? Potential. You ever have one of those moments? And I'm terrible about not seeing things. Have you ever been looking for something only to realize that you got it in your hand? I do that with my phone all the time. Get in a panic about where it is. I blame my wife and I blame my daughter and I blame my son. And immediately they return this statement back to me. If you just calm down and look in your hand, it's right there. The problem is sometimes we do this with people. We can walk right past a person. Over and over again. Without ever noticing him or her. And not even realize God had put them Right in our hand. Why do we do that? You want to know why we do that? Because we're psychiatrists. We've already sized them up. We've already figured out all their problems. We see them and we make our judgment and then we never speak to them again. Would Jesus have done that? If he was standing next to us when we make that judgment, would he make that judgment? Would he see the people we come in contact with in our daily lives as something that's not worth the time? It's not worth the effort. Is our perspective different than Jesus? Do some adjustments need to be made on our prescription? In order to know that answer, we need to look to Jesus to see how he saw people. And compare it to the way that we see him. Then we can make an honest decision. 
and ask the question to ourselves, do I see people how I want to see them or how Jesus sees them? I hope this lesson will be a reminder of Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in your mind. If I see like Jesus, then I prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Three things in the lesson will be yours. The first is this. Seeing like Jesus will help us. Now watch this. To see people for their potential and not their problems. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. I got three different areas of scripture and I won't spend a whole lot of time there. But I want to bring these points out. I hope that I can have just a minute of your time. Luke chapter 5 verses 27 through 32. Now watch what the word says. This is Levi, Matthew, the tax collector. It says, after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, Luke 5, 27, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 31, Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. In verse 32, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew, Levi has this great feast for Jesus. And who's there? The elite. The religious elite are there. The chief priests and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the ones that are there, right? No. The tax collectors and the sinners. And where was Jesus seated? Where was he sitting at? Jesus was right there amongst them. Now, what was Jesus doing? Trying to conform? Was he trying to conform to the way of these tax collectors and these sinners? Was he trying to, he must have been trying to join in and hear about these sinful ways. See, he came to the feast because he saw what the religious leaders didn't see. Jesus saw the potential, not the problem. And the religious elite, you know what they saw? They immediately saw the problem. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 9, you'll remember the religious elite said this about Jesus. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at a glutton and a wine bibber. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous. You want to know what I came to do? I came to save sinners, and I want them to repent. See, he knew. He was the one that could change something. And I want you to focus and think about this because you know it's true, child of God. Jesus is the only one that can heal a broken heart. He could change a wicked man from doing wicked things to do righteous things. Are we ever tempted to define people by their brokenness? And that drives us from ever striving to See if they ever need any help. See, the religious world would often do this in Jesus' day. You remember in Luke chapter 15, uh, verse 2, talking about the lost sheep. It says, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You remember the publican and the tax collector. He says uh, in Luke 18, 11, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. Or Luke 7, 39, it says, if he were a prophet, if Jesus was really a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this is. Is that us? See, Jesus didn't define people by their brokenness or their sin or their past. He looked at them with potential. Do we see the potential in people or do we see the problem? Because if we see the potential, we see life. Jesus. 
Number two, seeing like Jesus will help us to see that every person has the potential to be healed. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 verses 29 through 34. Matthew chapter 20 verses 29 through 34. The Bible says, Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And I want to say that one more time for emphasis. When, they, when Jesus passed by, put yourself in the story, they cried out, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. In verse 31, the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. In verse 32 it says, So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. In verse 34, So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Jesus, as he's leaving Jericho, has this great multitude following him. I'll be honest with you. If I had a great multitude following me, I'd think I was somebody. These two blind men cry out on the side, on the outskirts. Jesus, have mercy on me. But what does the crowd do? How did they see these blind men? They told them to be quiet. But what does Jesus do? <laughs> Have we forgot this? Jesus stands still. Stops. And he calls for him. Brothers, sisters, friend, hear this. Do we believe that God can heal a broken heart? A struggling heart? Do we believe that God can heal a sinful heart? Are we really convinced that the gospel can transform a person? See, if we really believe that, if we really and truly believe that the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone, why aren't we telling everybody? If you had the cure for COVID-19, wouldn't you go tell everybody who needed it? Jesus in this story has a great multitude that followed him. He had places that he needed to go. He had things that he needed to do. But despite all of that, it didn't stop him from seeing that people needed to be healed. What are we doing? See, never forget this, child of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that by Jesus' stripes, we're healed. We're healed. Number three. Seeing like Jesus will help us to see that every person has the potential for impact. This is one of my favorite points that I've ever done. Ever. Luke chapter 19. Turn with me there. Luke chapter 19. You'll be very familiar with this. And I'm not going to sing the song, but I'll say it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in that sycamore tree, right? Why? Because the Lord he wanted to see, right? You know that song. Why don't y'all spend some time after this is over singing that song? I don't care if you got kids or not. Sing that song with whoever's listening to you. That's your homework. And I'm going to ask Stephen if y'all did it. Now look at this story, Luke 19, 1 through 9. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was 
short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I gave, give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. And I'll read verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Despite the haters, despite the naysayers, Jesus was focused on the mission. And it wasn't checking his boxes. He was going to the sinner's house regardless. But Jesus did something to Zacchaeus. See, Jesus made such an impact on Zacchaeus' life by caring about him that Zacchaeus immediately makes an impact on others. Remember verse 8. Look, Lord, I gave half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone fa falsely, I restore it to them fourfold. Now, tell me that wouldn't make an impact on some poor Jew's life. Immediately. Hey, man, I'm going to pay you back for what I wrongfully took from you. And then that person takes it and says... Wait a minute, that's too much. No, no, no. That's what, I, that's what I owe you. Could you imagine the impact? All from Jesus showing up at his house. Do we see the lost? Are we looking for and excited when we have the opportunity to give somebody hope? <laughs> By telling them about the one who can heal them? Because there ain't no telling what that person will do for the glory of God when they realize Jesus loves them. I'm glad somebody saw me with Jesus' vision. I'm glad somebody saw potential in me and not my problems. I'm glad somebody saw that I had the potential and deserved the opportunity to be healed through the gospel. I'm glad that somebody saw the potential in me that I could make an impact on a lost and dying world for God's glory. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm a dope dealer from way back. I've lived a life of foolishness and silliness. I did so many things that I'm embarrassed of and disappointed that I put myself in that position. When I think about those things and I realize that I don't measure up, how I don't deserve to even be considered a child of God, I'm reminded of one thing, that Jesus loves me. And I can stand before you today saying that I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus and he's given me an amazing responsibility. And I get to for the rest of my life, and this is true for all children of God, I get to be an ambassador for the king, man. For the king. I get to be a representative of the kingdom of Christ to the world. Christians should be looking and be ready to share with others the hope we have within us. Do we realize that the harvest is truly plentiful? What's our perspective? Real talk. What are we seeing? I want to ask this, and I hope that this will resonate in your mind as we close. 
Has Satan clouded our vision? Satan's real happy right now with all the mess that's going on. Satan's real happy for anxiety, paranoia, anger. He's, he's really excited that all of this stuff is going on. Has Satan clouded our vision? Well, then tonight is the night to change that. I want to close with this verse, Romans chapter 1. My favorite area of scripture. I love it. Paul says in verse 14 that I am a debtor. <laughs> I owe it to both Greeks, barbarians, to the know-it-alls, and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I'm ready to preach the word. To preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And then he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Brethren, are we scared of the gospel of Christ? Are we ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. You want to know how it's true? If, uh, how we can tell if we're scared of the gospel? Verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And you want to know how it's revealed? From faith to faith. James chapter 2 verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I hope you guys have a good night. I hope that this has been a blessing for you. I love you guys so much. And I, one day I hope I get to see you again. But if I don't, I know one day I'll see you in our heavenly home. And boy, I can't wait for that day. God bless you.